What's going on everybody? It's Andy the Mad Tatter and welcome back to the channel. Indeed, welcome if it's your first time joining us here. Uh, my name's Andy, I'm a full-time eBay reseller based in Cheshire, Northwest UK. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more into detail with that in just a moment when I've introduced the video. Uh, sorry I've not made a video in a little while. Uh, if you saw my last video, uh, which was the sort of haul video and a little bit of a mini catch-up there, uh, you'll know that I bought rather a lot of stock in January and February, uh, more than I could realistically manage. Uh, normally, I don't tend to have a death pile. I don't tend to have stuff that's kind of sat in abeyance. Uh, I tend to have, you know, I tend to buy it, prep it, photo it, list it, put it away. I don't tend to have stuff lying around. Um, I've ended up in a position where I've had quite a lot of stuff lying around just because of different circumstances through January and February. Um, so I've been trying to catch up with that really and get myself back on track and get sort of organized and not have to have that sort of death pile aspect uh, again. Uh, I have also listened to some of your comments uh, from my, my previous videos as well uh, about the length of videos for one uh, and also the lighting on videos where the background and, and the kind of overall lighting was phasing in and out a little bit. So what I've done with this video is I've tried to sort of light it a little bit better. I, I don't really have a whole lot of experience in making these videos as is probably evident if you've seen any of my content. Um, so. I've just sort of tried tried my best with the lighting, really, and hopefully this will be a little bit more um, stable and not kind of keep fading in and out of the background. In terms of the length of the videos, um, with my scheduled videos, my planned videos, things like, you know, the sales roundups and stuff like that, absolutely, uh, I'll be trying to cut those down in length a little bit, uh, make them a little bit more efficient for people. Uh, but this video today is going to be a little bit more chatty uh, and a little bit more sort of free-forming. Um, and it's going to be about what I believe to be the reseller mindset uh, and a little bit of an introduction to the reseller mindset. Um, the whole aim and the whole goal of this channel is to help anybody who is interested in the prospect of selling on eBay, uh, either as you know a little bit of side income or as a main source of income, whatever way you want to do that. The whole purpose of this channel is to sort of sort the wheat from the chaff and help you do that as effectively as possible really um you know i'll share with you the benefit of my experience on ebay but i'll also share with you some of the benefits of my experience from like my professional background and also my personal uh, background and stuff as well and that's a little bit about what i wanted to talk about at the beginning of this video um first of all i've got to prefix this by saying if this comes across as in any way um awkward or um uncomfortable from my perspective that's because it is uh, I don't really like talking about myself in terms of what I've achieved and what I've done with my life and stuff like that um, I don't consider myself to be anything special um, I don't you know I, as far as I'm concerned I'm, I'm a monkey with shoes just like everybody else is there's no sort of you know no one person is any more or less special than anybody else in my eyes we're all just monkeys with shoes. So I don't like to kind of come on camera and say, yeah, I've done this, I've done this, I've done X, Y, Z and, and stuff like that and, and sound like I'm sort of um, bigging myself up in any way because I'm far from my favourite person and I'm far from my own favourite specialist subject. But I think in terms of offering advice uh, and in terms of trying to offer some guidance to people that are getting into doing this, I think it's important to understand where I've come from so that you can kind of see the experiences that I've had and that will sort of... I guess give me a, an element of credibility. Um, I mean, my eBay performance, I guess, is one thing, but in terms of some of the things that I'm going to talk about sales-wise in general um, and, and working in kind of customer-facing roles and things like that, uh, I think it's kind of a little bit important to understand some of my working history uh, and some of my, my own personal sort of history a little bit as well. So I'm going to go into that first. I'm going to keep that bit as brief as possible. Um, and then I'm going to start talking about this this whole concept of the reseller mindset um, because there's a lot of videos out there and there is absolutely a place for these type of videos and this type of content but there are a lot of videos out there which offer you practical tips for reselling um, I know when I first started looking at YouTube content for reselling um, I must have seen the tip uh, don't pay for cardboard boxes get them from supermarkets and stuff like that I must have seen that on nine out of ten of the YouTube videos that I looked at at the time now absolutely there are play there is a place for practical tips like that and I don't begrudge anybody for giving those types of tips and I don't begrudge anybody for following those types of tips they are perfectly valid um, but I want to be a little bit more um, I kind of want to help you to help yourself in a sense I want to sort of 
get, give you a little bit of an insight into my thought processes and maybe through that you'll be able to sort of identify how you can progress with reselling or how you can get started with reselling off on your own account rather than having to sort of go by oh this is what such and such a youtuber said i should do or this is what you know such and such a ebay store looks like or anything like that i want to be able to say like look you know yeah these are what these people are doing and what they look like but you can run your business very much for you you run your reselling experience your business your ebay store whatever you want to call it you run that for you you don't run that to anybody else's uh standards you don't run that to anybody else's metrics with obviously the exception of ebay's own standards you've got to follow those to stay on the platform but in terms of um you know what youtubers say what people on facebook groups say what people on instagram say and things like that Yes, there's some very valid information out there. I'm not trying to take away from anybody and I'm not trying to directly attack anybody either. But what I'm trying to say is you will have a much better overall uh, future and overall experience by doing things the way you want to do them and the way that it's enjoyable for you to do them um, rather than doing them the way some YouTuber or some eBay seller is doing them, however successful that individual may be. If you don't enjoy the same things that they enjoy and you don't get that pleasure out of the same things that they do, then you're not going to have the same experience as them. And this is this is something that is really not touched on enough, I don't think, with resellers and the, and the sort of content that goes on to YouTube in, in respect of reselling. You and I could buy exactly the same item. We could uh, pay exactly the same price for it. It could be exactly the same thing in exactly the same condition. Uh, I could list that item, you could list that item, we could put it on at the same price. Um, you might sell it before me, I might sell it before you. I might sell it, you might not. You might sell it, I might not. Everyone's experience is different, and everyone's experience is going to be different based upon how they put listings together, how they you know, promote their listings, put their store together, uh, things like that as well. So there's no, there's, there is never, as far as I'm concerned, a one size fits all answer for any question in respect of sales um, and in, in respect of sort of running an eBay business. There's no one size fits all answer. And really, there aren't too many quick wins either. So when you see a lot of these adverts, uh, generally on YouTube videos and stuff like that, uh, and, and they're quite often, you know, youngish American guys with fancy haircuts saying, I made $5 million last week. Um, no, you didn't, you know. And if you did, you certainly didn't just make it selling on eBay. You've been doing something else. Again, these guys, they're probably, you know, there is probably some sort of legit aspect to them, but it's just, it's all fluff at the end of the day. I'm not going to charge you for any of the information that I give you, because as far as I'm concerned, there are no secrets in this, you know. There's no, I'm not doing anything that you couldn't do. Similarly, you know, there's people that have been selling on eBay since eBay began. They're not doing anything new. They're not doing anything revolutionary. There are very, very few genuinely new and revolutionary ideas that come to the market these days, uh, particularly in terms of sales. So, however one person might present themselves to you, or however a group of people might present themselves to you, they are no more special than you. Uh, even if they've been more successful on eBay or anything like that, they're no more special or less special than you. You can do what you want to do anytime you want to do it um, without having to sort of think, oh, you know, this big YouTuber or this big eBay store has done it this way, so I've got to do it this way. I think I've laboured that point quite a bit now, so I won't sort of try and make that point again. But yeah, um, so for me to start sort of giving you that kind of advice and that kind of chat, I do think it's important to understand me a little bit more. So I'll get through my working history really quickly. I didn't do particularly well at school. I didn't do particularly badly at school. I think my best my best grade uh, in my sort of final high school exams, my GCSEs as they're called in the UK, uh, I got a, my highest grade was a B in English language and my lowest grade was a G in business studies and IT. Uh, the reason my grade was so low in business studies and IT is because the teacher was a knobhead. Uh, so I almost just stopped trying just to spite him as much as anything. And quite a few people in my same class, in my class did the same thing. We just stopped trying just to make the grades look shit on him, essentially. Um, so I wanted to be a vet 
all my life that was kind of what I wanted to do growing up. Uh, in high school, I was pretty much told point blank by the careers advisor that I wasn't clever enough to do that, um, which completely destroyed my sort of confidence and, and my sort of um, approach to work and things like that. And my approach to having aspiration, having career aspirations kind of stopped right at that point because somebody who I saw as being an authority figure had told me that I wasn't clever enough to do what I'd wanted to do all my life. Um, so it was just kind of, yeah, that, that wrote me off from doing something like that, really. So um, rather than pursue any further education or anything like that, after that, I went straight into work. Uh, I went straight into work at 15 years old on a weekend job. As soon as I was 16, I started, you know, working part time and full time. Um, I worked in a couple, a couple of sort of weekend shop jobs, uh, my, the favorite of which was working for um, a company that sold outdoor wear. Uh, so sort of outdoor coats, outdoor shoes, boots, things like that. And I think that's kind of what ignited the passion for that within me at a younger age. Uh, and I, I, you know, that's kind of where my love for the outdoors and for outdoor gear came from. Uh, I then went and worked, uh, my first sort of pro proper, if you like, full-time job uh, was actually working in a garden centre. Uh, the garden centre was a great experience on, on a number of levels because not only was it sort of... Uh, the biggest kind of place that I'd worked at that point in terms of the size of the site, but also there was the most going on uh, because there were a lot of different departments within the garden center. And it was the first time I'd ever worked anywhere where there were so many different departments for things. So it was really good to be able to kind of move around and learn about different types of products in different areas of the garden center, essentially. Um, put it this way, I worked there for about 18 months and I don't think I ever dealt with plants so, you know, I, I was always on things like barbecues, garden furniture, hard landscaping products, uh, fences, sheds, gravels, things like that. Um, you know, even some of the giftware and stuff like that that they sold, they actually had a clothing department as well where they were selling a little bit of outdoor clothing there. So my previous experience uh, factored into that a little bit as well. Uh, one of the, skipping back ever so slightly, one of the weekend temporary jobs that I had was working for a, a, a national chain of jewellers. And uh, it was actually, at the time I applied for the job, it was the job on the list that I least wanted to do uh, because it just seemed a little bit poncy to me. But, you know, it, they, they were advertising for staff, so I stuck a CV and they were offering, you know, at the time they were offering probably the best sort of wage that I could have got at that age. Um, so I did some temp uh, for a national jewellery company. Uh, it was really, really enjoyable. That's where jewellery and watches got under my skin straight away. And also the concept of customer service uh, that was where that really started to get drilled into me as well. So cut back again forward to working at the garden centre. Um, at the time, I was sort of thinking, you know, I was I was about 18 at this point. So I was starting to think, OK, it's time to, to look for a, a really proper job now. It's time to start thinking about a career. I kind of got over through through building my own confidence from just working in the in the sort of adult world after leaving school. Um, that, that really did wonders for my confidence and kind of got me over the whole thing of being smacked down by the school careers advisor. Um, so my confidence was, you know, was, was sort of restored a little bit in that sense. Uh, and it was time for me to start thinking about a career. So based on the fact that I'd really enjoyed this weekend temporary job uh, in the jewellery trade, I started looking around for, for sort of smaller companies that were hiring, uh, somebody that I could really get in there and sort of progress from the ground up and, and you know, learn everything from, from beginning to end. Because even though I'd left that job, which I saw as a temporary, you know, just a throwaway job in a way, even though I'd left that job, I'd still found myself buying little books on gemstones and stuff like that every now and again and reading up on things like that because it just kind of, it got under my skin and it interested me straight away. So I then ended up working uh, for an independent jewelers and pawnbrokers. So I learned the jewelry trade from the ground up. I learned customer service. You know, it was like going back to school in terms of customer service as well in many ways because the the customer expectation and the customer dynamic was very different in that environment to anything that I'd been in before. It was much more um, selling emotionally to people rather, uh, you know, isn't this nice? Isn't this, you know, beautiful? This is going to look lovely on your, you know, your wedding day or whatever. Uh, whatever set of circumstances we were talking about, it was much more about sort of selling on an emotional level than it was on a kind of technical or um, what would be the word be like a almost like a surgical level where it's just kind of here are the facts of the item. Do you want it or not? Um, 
And of course, learning pawnbroking as well, which is lending against jewellery and watches and stuff like that, that kind of taught me a whole new, uh, added a whole new string to my bow. And I think that's probably where the professional introduction to buying and selling came from, really. Uh, there's always been an element of buying and selling in my life at some point or another, uh, whether it's been from me or whether it's been from family members. Um, the family business uh, would have been scrap metal, uh, had my granddad not sold the business uh, when I was very young and run off to France with the money. Uh, fair play to him, that's what he wants to do. I, can't, you know, I hold no grudges against people for doing that. It's, again, it's what you want to do in your life. So um, I think it's kind of ingrained in me a little bit in that sense. But also uh, things like as I was growing up, I remember in the days before eBay and stuff like that, my mum would quite often go and buy clothing from uh, charity shops or she'd go and buy it from car boot sales. And then she'd sell it through these uh, what they call dress agencies, which were just independent stores that were selling uh, clothing on behalf of customers and taking a percentage cut. So, you know, I remember my mum used to make my mum did make some reasonable money uh, at times selling things through these dress agencies and stuff like that. So. You know, I think there's always been that aspect of buying and selling in me, and that was just further hammered home by uh, working as a pawnbroker as well, and being able to assess value on things, and being able to kind of look at the gulf between what I want to pay for an item versus what it's going to sell for, and any associated costs in between, things like that. A lot of that came from the pawnbroking side of things as well. Working in that business, uh, I learned about gemstones, precious metals, watches, uh, you, you name it really. In terms of jewellery and watches, that, that business working there taught me so much. And I actually went uh, and put myself through college while I was working in that job as well. My boss at the time very kindly let me cut my hours down uh, to attend a college course where I learned about manufacturing, repairing and um, designing jewellery as well. So that was kind of a good string to have to my bow working in that business because it meant that the second-hand jewellery that came in through the pawnbroking side of the business was something that then we didn't have to outsource to a workshop. I could repair it or, you know, uh, restore it, do whatever needed to be done to it, get it ready for sale uh, and do it all in-house. So it was excellent uh, from that perspective for me. Uh, and I worked for that company for around about nine years. Now, the reason I ended up leaving that company, uh, it was a very small family-run business. And at the time, I was kind of getting that feeling uh, what would I have been? I'd have been probably about 24. No, about 27, wouldn't I? Yeah, about... Probably about 24 when I went to college. Yeah, I'd have been about 27, I think, by the time I ended up leaving that business. Um, and the reason I left that business was because I wanted to kind of progress. And it was a small family-run company. And no matter how much I personally was able to progress, obviously as a family business, family members are always going to come in and they're going to sort of take those management roles and things like that. So I'd kind of got as far as I could get within that I, I could get within that company. Really enjoyed my time working for that business and they it was a fantastic experience all around. I learned a lot from really old school retailers as well. You know, the, the business had been established since 1880 uh, and it was a family run business, so all of the kind of um experiences and stuff that had been passed down through the generations you can't make up for that, uh, you know, the, the, I don't think you ever get that type of experience working for a big corporate company or anything like that. But as I say, I started wanting to go down the management path uh, and make, you know, sort of, I was chasing money, essentially, I was chasing a salary, I was chasing that better wage. Um, and although I could have made a lot of money had I stuck at the practical side of jewellery, the curve from... Um, it's, it's a very steep curve, so you've you've really got to get to a, a seriously high level before you start making seriously, seriously high money as a working jeweller or as a manufacturing jeweller. And it takes a long time to get to that seriously high level. So I looked at it from the perspective of I could go down the management route, I could earn more, more money sooner uh, and not have to kind of... And, and I could still use those skills that I'd had from uh, being a practical working jeweller and sort of apply those into the, the, the field of running a jewellery shop as well. So I went and worked then for a national, um, a chain store of jewellers and pawnbrokers. They were one of the biggest ones in the country. Um, I started work for them in a brand new store that they'd opened uh, as an assistant manager uh, within my first, I think, about three months there. 
uh, they gave me. This is this is where it starts to get like awkward for me because I don't like this sort of thing. But again, I don't know. Is it relevant? I don't know. But I'm gonna put it out there anyway. Um, after my first sort of couple of months there, I was employee of the month. Um, after eight months as an assistant manager in that store, they moved me to uh, another store and gave me the manager's position uh, at that store. Um, I did a lot of training with staff and stuff like that, teaching them, you know, to teaching them what I knew essentially about the kind of practical side of jewellery and enabling them to be able to do their jobs better by uh, having a bit more of a, a, a technical understanding of things as well. So, um, yeah, went and managed this store. Uh, the store that they sent me to had uh, a relatively small team, but it was kind of 50 50. They were brilliant staff and staff that weren't so great there wasn't kind of anything in between um the store at the time that i started there was around about i think it was in the bottom third of progress you know just the sort of store rankings there's about 150 stores in the company um and it was in the sort of bottom third but i could definitely see the potential there for the store and uh, certainly in some of the staff that were there as well the assistant manager at the time a couple of the full-time staff they were fantastic so there was definitely potential there so we had to be really ruthless and i kind of got all the staff around and i sat them down and i said look this is where we are this is where we need to be this is where we can be um but i need everybody on board to get there and if anybody wants to you know abandon ship now kind of thing there'll be no hard feelings against it and sure enough you know once once i think once the gravity of the situation had set in with some of these staff uh i did get two people hand their notices in within about the first week that i was there as a manager now um long story short because i could talk about working for this company for a long time and particularly for working for the first store that i was a manager for them for because that was some of the best experience i've had uh in terms of actually sort of running a business essentially uh was working there um but the long story short is that in uh the space of about nine months we went from being uh in the bottom third uh of sort of statistics and figures to basically being second from the top uh throughout the entire company and that was uh based on the sort of year on year growth as well so there were brand new stores that had opened up who didn't have a year's figures behind them um so their year on year growth was obviously massive uh but we were still exhibiting more growth than the projected growth that some of these new stores were having um so we did really well uh and and a lot of that was down to sort of just consulting with the customers as much as anything and saying to the customers, you know, what do you want out of the business as much as what we want to offer to you? What do you want out of the business? Now, in the space of time that I worked for that company, um, I also, uh, with a couple of other managers, not entirely solo, although I did do quite a lot of work on it in fairness, um, with a couple of other managers, we completely rewrote the policies uh, for the company on how they lent money against and purchased diamonds. Um, because they were way off uh, what they should have been doing, in, in our opinion, at the time. And that turned out to be, you know, the, the right move because that was adopted by the company as well. Uh, I also ended up working as a prestige watch consultant for other stores. So other stores in the company would ring my store, speak to me, ask for values and prices on watches, uh, things like that as well, quest technical questions on watches and stuff like that. Uh, and I also ended up being a sort of... Um, almost like a relief area manager to a certain extent because I was I was in a position where when the area manager was off I became a point of contact with a couple of again with a couple of other managers uh, there were only three in the area there was me and two other managers we became this point of contact for the other stores when the area manager was off um, so that one that was great and then they moved me to another store again to try and get me to sort of replicate the success that i'd had in this particular store uh but the problem with that store that they then moved me to was a completely disinterested team um who i just couldn't motivate for the life of me so that that was kind of doomed to failure before it ever started then it looked like the company was going to start going into administration which they ultimately did um so i kind of got out while the getting was good uh, and went and worked in the motor trade I worked for a very short space of time for a franchise uh, main dealer um, 
by which I mean literally at the space of a couple of months I worked for them. However, even in that short space of time, it was a pretty good learning experience. And I did pick up quite a few different tips and a few different um, sort of aspects of sales process that I'd not been privy to before. Uh, that was also the reason why I left there is because that the sales process is so heavily uh, ingrained that there is no sort of emotion to it almost. It's very much a kind of, as a car salesman, if, if, you're work, if you ever go and buy a car from a main dealer environment, the salesman who sits down in front of you is not the person who's selling you the car. Um, the, the salesperson that sits down in front of you is essentially an intermediary between you, the customer, and the business manager in the back room. And it's ultimately the business manager in the back room that makes the deal. Um, you're just the kind of go-between. That was certainly my experience of working for a main dealer anyway. Um, so I didn't enjoy that at all. I wanted to have much more control over my own sales and things like that. And that was what then led me to go and work for an independent car dealer because I'm a car person. I enjoyed the environment of working for a car dealer. I just didn't like the way they sold stuff. And I did learn a lot of stuff in that space of time as well. The manager there, he was a youngish guy, but he was, he'd really progressed through the company quite quickly. A uh, really smart guy, really switched on. Um, and he was the one that taught me, I've said this before in a couple of my videos, he was the one that taught me about sort of riding that middle line and never letting the highs get you too high and the lows get you too low that was where i learned that from and i also learned a lot about earning the right to to kind of progress to the next stage with customers and stuff like that as well which is something i'm going to go into with these videos um so long story short again uh went and worked for a car a independent car dealership uh worked for them for sort of five years got up to the point where i was the the used car sales manager uh for that business and again, you know, just a really generally enjoyable time. Um, from there, though, my health did start to suffer a bit. Um, I put on a lot of weight and I started getting a lot of pain in my body here, there and everywhere. I was tired all the time and stuff like that. And I couldn't explain it at all. Uh, and it turned out that I was diabetic. Uh, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And a lot of that was down to working environment. I, I personally think uh, as a car sales manager, particularly, you spend a lot of time sat at a desk um drinking coffee eating cakes eating donuts and stuff like that and and quite often because you're dealing with finance companies and things like that these reps from finance companies they'll come in and they'll try and bribe you with donuts and stuff um so you kind of you, you're in an atmosphere where you're not moving around very much and you're just kind of piling sugary crap into your body for the most part so it's hardly surprising really that i ended up diabetic but i thought it was time to get out of that environment um i then went and worked in the pet trade uh, I worked for a national pet, uh, a national pet supply retailer, uh, and I also then went and worked for a small independent pet retailer as well. After that, uh, the reason I left the big national one, in spite of doing very well with them, was uh, I was promoted again, promoted to uh, an assistant manager's position. They sent me to another store, and of course, uh, the, the history repeated itself. Really, they sent me to a store with a completely disinterested team, uh, and also a completely disinterested management team. Uh, and because I wasn't the overall manager of the store, I was pissing in the wind essentially with that store. It was one of those things where the management weren't interested, so the staff weren't interested. And if you can't get the management to be interested, then they're never going to get the staff to be interested. Uh, so I just. <sighs> I couldn't be doing with it, so I left. Went and worked for a smaller independent as a manager. Uh, opened the st opened a store with them. Um, got to a really good point. Uh, then, as I've said before in other videos, my wife and my mum uh, both sort of started falling ill at the same sort of time. Uh, they needed sort of various different hospital visits and doctors visits and stuff like that that they needed to uh, while they were undergoing diagnosis and stuff like that. Um, and that was when I was told by the, the, the sort of owner of the business I was working for not to make my problems company problems uh, when I suggested that I might need a little bit of time off here and there to run people to appointments. So left that business. Um, I To be honest with you, if I hadn't have left that business, they'd have probably sacked me anyway because I just completely mentally switched off. That Those, those, words, that, those words will stick with me forever. Um, you know, the, the owner of that business had had a really major health care himself, uh, health scare himself at that point, um, which I'd come in and worked, you know, days off and worked overtime and stuff um, to cover for him going to appointments and stuff like that. And then when I sort of said, you know, can I get a bit back this, the other way almost? Uh, that was when I was told not to make my problems company problems. So that 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 will stick with me forever. And that was the moment where my brain just went that's it i'm out of here i switched off from that business and and i stopped i completely stopped caring 
from from that moment onwards and as i say had i not left when i did they'd have probably ended up sacking me anyway because i was so disenfranchised by that point so that was when i ended up as a reseller uh jumped in both feet first and went full time after starting to do this part time uh for a little while prior uh i've been reselling for probably about 6 months prior to sort of leaving the job um, just on a part-time basis with little bits and pieces from around the house and stuff like that uh, and then I jumped straight into doing uh, reselling full-time which was scary as hell um, I'm not even gonna lie that was one of the daftest moves I've ever made in my life but luckily I had a lot of support from family I had a lot of support from my wife um, so everybody was kind of behind me doing this uh, and it really you know it, it's been as it happens it's been the right move to have made so that brings us to where we are now, and that actually I've just noticed on the camera makes for about a half hour video as well. So what I'll do, I'll probably cut this video off here, um, and sort of say thank you very much for watching this part of the video. The next part of the video, we will get into starting to detail the um, reseller thought processes initial things that you might want to think about when you start in getting into reselling questions you might have before you start reselling um hopefully i'll be able to answer some of those for you as well as we go along down the line uh, but for now guys uh, what i will say on this half of the video is if you did enjoy the video please leave me a thumbs up if you didn't feel free to leave a thumbs down but don't just thumb and run uh, let me know what you did and didn't like in the comment section down below and I'll try and tailor the future content to be a little bit more palatable for you if I can. Um, if you do enjoy the, the channel and you do enjoy the content, do feel free to hit the subscribe button uh, and give the bell icon a little tickle there as well. And that'll notify you whenever I update, uh, upload new videos. But otherwise, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye bye.